afternoon. It's terrific to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Danielle Allen. I'm the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics here at Harvard. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll save it for. Nothing could give me more pleasure than the chance to welcome Cornell West back to the Harvard campus. And I've been really selfish in planning this event because you all know, as I do, what an incredible speaker Dr. West, Brother West is. And instead of letting everybody just listen to him the way we often want to do, I wanted to revisit my own undergraduate experience. When Professor West, Brother West, was one of my teachers at Princeton, he saved a little lost soul. He truly did. <laughs> Weekly meetings in his office at a time of personal crisis for myself. Mm personal crisis for myself that was related to broad social crises. It was 89 to 92, 93, 92 is the LA riots. It was a hot time on campuses, issues of political correctness. So it's a time like our time. And we will get to talking about the current social crises and the meaning of America as Brother West defines it now. But I wanted to start by talking about philosophy. And I'm not gonna do an introduction because this is a man who needs no introduction. My introduction was really just to affirm that speaking as a student in, from the years when I was 18 to 22, he made a life-changing difference for me. And he has made a life-changing difference for so many people. And we are simply, truly mm. lucky, blessed. At any rate, I, I will just say one last thing, which is, you know, the, the, the people, you count yourself lucky to have been alive at the same time um, as them. So, enough, enough from me, uh, okay? So philosophy, we're gonna talk about philosophy before we get to policy and social crises. And I wanted to start by asking Cornell to talk about pragmatism. He works in the tradition of American pragmatism he has articulated a vision for his own work that he has sometimes called prophetic pragmatism, although he has also sometimes disavowed that label. And I just want to hear about what is this thing, prophetic pragmatism? Mm, thank you very much. Well, let me first say I am so blessed to be here and to be back. And I want to begin by saluting my dear sister Danielle, Professor Allen, who I consider the major political theorist of democracy of her generation, her training in the classics, the powerful text on Prometheus, and then on to Talking with Strangers, magnificent book on Plato, and now this award-winning text just won the Parkman on the Declaration of Independence. As a teacher, which is a sacred profession, a really vocation, it's a calling to see students soar like eagles. It just brings joy to my heart. And so to be able to be in dialogue with her almost 30 years later. It's been a while. Yeah, it's a long <laughs> while. And she's still, still, so give it up for Danielle Allen. Yeah. Give it up, Danielle Allen. Definitely. I mean, I feel brother Brandon Professor, Brandon Professor Terry, who brought me here a couple of years ago for the black men, and he's another one I love to I keep say, track of. He's magnificent. No, but it's all of them together. To Tommy Shelby exactly. sitting next to Tim Scanlon. I mean, so many folk here, exactly. especially of the younger generation. Now, Tim Scanlon's a little bit older than what I'm talking about, <laughs> but he's responsible for the same tradition because anytime I talk about pragmatism, I really begin on an existential note. I begin with my own life. I am who I am because somebody loved me, somebody cared for me, somebody attended. To me, I'll never have a higher honor in the world than being the second son of Lake Clifton, the present Irene B. West, and being a product on the chocolate side of Sacramento, a Shiloh Baptist Church, Reverend Cook. We had pastors, not CEOs in those days. Uh, we 
there, Deacon Hinton and Sarah Ray wrestling with the Book of Job in vacation Bible school. And then when I made my way to Harvard, at that time, of course, this was the golden age of American philosophy. The first one was William James and George Santayana, and Josiah Royce, the turn of the century. But when I arrived, you had the philosophic gang of six, six unadulterated philosophic geniuses. And they were so kind to me. John Rawls, W.V. Quine, Nelson Goodman, Stanley Cavell, Robert Nozick, my dear brother Hillary Putnam, who just passed. I was blessed to take courses with all of them. I arrive connected to the Black Panther Party, could never join because I'm a Christian, but I work very closely with them. I embrace their secular sensibilities. I just didn't reach the same conclusion. <laughs> but I worked in the, in the breakfast program in Jamaica Plain, and I taught every week after church at Norfolk State Prison. And I still teach in prisons. I've taught in prisons for 37 years now. I've just finished the course in Rawway. So that when I arrived, I found that kind of love and affirmation. And similarly, so when I went to Princeton with Richard Rorty and Sheldon Wolden. So when you're really talking about the philosophical Weltanschauung, the worldview that you have, you want to be very candid in terms of what has gone into the shaping of who you are. And you see, pragmatism really is the great American moment in the grand humanist tradition that goes all the way back to the rich Socratic legacy of Athens and the rich prophetic legacy of Jerusalem. So that the end and aim is interrogation, examination, but it's a historicist turn. When you historicize, you contextualize, you pluralize, and you try to humanize. So it's about fallibility, or fallibilism, not skepticism, but fallibilism, acknowledging that any claim you make is open to revision and so forth. So, so real fast, yes. what are we interrogating? What we're interrogating, we're interrogating ourselves. We're interrogating the civil war that takes place on the battlefield of our own hearts, minds, and souls in terms of the best of who we are and the worst of who we are. You're interrogating your assumptions and presuppositions and prejudgments. You come to Harvard, learn how to die. <laughs> well, that's what it's about. Because paideia, what the Greeks called deep education, not superficial schooling. Schooling, you just come here and get a skill and gain access to a job and go get a hedge fund job. Okay. <laughs> you wasted somebody's money. But deep education is about learning how to die. You know, Plato says, mm -hmm. philosophy, a love of wisdom, meditation on and preparation for death. To philosophize is to learn how to die. It says Montaigne and even Seneca. We don't expect too much death from the Romans. But Seneca said, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. Who has the courage to examine themselves, their society, their world, but then connect it to, for me, the grand legacy of Jerusalem, which is spreading that loving kindness, justice, especially to orphan, widow, fatherless, motherless, especially to those who are subordinated. So it's like a fusion of, and pragmatism beginning with the Emersonian backdrop, but especially the genius of Charles Sanders Peirce, especially the sheer, uh, it's more than just genius, because William James, he was the most adorable of all public intellectuals I know. All right. Just what adorable. made him so adorable? It's amazing. He had a openness, a sensitivity, and empathy. When Du Bois arrived, he made Du Bois uh, gained access to the philosophy club against the white supremacist sensibilities of the day. Of course, he was vice president of the Anti-Imperialist League. He spoke out on behalf of our precious Filipino brothers and sisters and when they were being sub subjugated and dominated by U.S. Army. And of course, had no B.A., had no M.A., had no Ph.D. So That's the name. That's the brother who that building's named after. William. All he had was an M.D. But he's in the philosophy department because he wrote a classic on principles of psychology. The variety of religious experience, the Gifford lectures. You see. So that, that's my tradition. Now what I do is, though, I add my own uh, experience and my own tradition because I come from a people who have been terrorized and traumatized and stigmatized for over 400 years. So that pragmatism begins with the problematic, I begin with the catastrophic. 
Let's just pause on the problematic for one second. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right, we'll get to the catastrophic. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay? All so right. Uh, the problematic. Yes, yes. The learning how to die. Yes. How is that about moving forward? What's about moving forward? Because one, uh, we have to acknowledge just the, the dominant ways of the world. The dominant ways of the world tend to be either complacency, conformity, tend to be apathy, tend to be uh, lukewarmness, tend to be uh, uh, larger structures, domination, exploitation, and subordination. Those are the dominant ways of the world. That's why democracies are so fragile. It takes so much courage, vision, organizing, and mobilizing to create some space for that. And therefore, when you're really talking about learning how to die, you're talking about the highest levels of intellectual, moral, I would say also spiritual courage connected to that compassion especially that comes out of legacy of Jerusalem, no matter how secularized or not secularized. How do you bring that together? That's been the major challenge. And when I think of those who inform what I do every day, I'm talking about W.B. Du Bois, how shall integrity face oppression? What does honesty do in the face of deception? What does decency do in the face of insult? How shall courage meet brute force? Those are the four questions of Du Bois product of this institution. So this is Ella what, Baker the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before we bring in the catastrophic. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'll push it's one always more there moment. waiting for it. Catastrophic no, is always I there know. waiting for it. <laughs> I know. I want to just push one more moment on the problematic. Yes, yes. The pushing off against, the kicking against. So that, that's a question people have about pragmatism. Is it just about reacting to the problems, whether they are oppression, domination, poverty, injustice. If you're just reacting, how do you know where you're going? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, wonderful question. You know, Dewey wrote a wonderful essay on American pragmatism where he said that this indigenous form of philosophical reflection in the U.S. empire is characteristic of ascribing near metaphysical status to futurity, to the future, consequences, effects, so that the practical is not reducible to just the instrumental and narrow sense. We talked about this in your class this mm -hmm. morning, you see. It's not just reducible to the utilitarian. It's concerned about integrity too. But because it accents the future, it's about vision. It's about virtues. It's about values. Now, of course, these days, you know, you read the newspapers, New York Times, any other newspaper, someone so is pragmatic, what they mean is opportunistic. It's not the same thing at all. So define at the all. difference. Opportunism is just seizing the next opportunity, usually not informed by vision with short-term gain. Pragmatism, the centrality of practical judgment. Phronesis in the Aristotelian sense. Okay. Phronesis. Explain. Practical judgment is you are informed by visions, but you're looking for the live options available for you at any particular historical moment so that you refuse to be simply seizing the next opportunity if it violates your integrity, but you're prudential, the way in which Edmund Burke talked about prudence. Even our right-wing brothers and sisters have great insight. <laughs> Edmund Burke on prudence comes same out of that grand humanist tradition back to so Socrates back to Amos, back to Jesus, back to Mohammed, back to a host of others. And of course, we don't want to downplay our brothers and sisters from Eastern civilization. I'm talking primarily about the West. And the West has its own blindnesses and so forth. The East has its own insights and blindnesses too. But what shaped me primarily was, here I am, a black man born in a nation deeply shaped by white supremacy, deeply shaped by class conflict, deeply shaped by imperial sensibilities vis-a-vis -vis our indigenous brothers and sisters, and then six million subsumed in the 1890s of Guam and Philippines and Hawaii and so forth, and then the fight back. So that pragmatism is always about vision, value, but you're fighting back. I mean, you read John Dewey's text. My God, art has experience, nothing crude and instrumental there. You read his Gifford lectures, The Quest for Certainty. Very subtle, but very concerned about the role of science and the new physics and how important and inescapable and fundamental the new science is. And yet at the same time, it is not the sole point of reference in terms of how we understand how we live our lives or even how we understand how 
knowledge is produced. There's a difference between scientism and ascription to the authority of science. There's a difference between scientific temperament and the idolizing of scientific method. And Dewey spends a lot of time making this distinction. Again, very, very jazz-like. <laughs> Flexible, fluid, protein, and that's what we love about the Nelson Goodmans and others. The pluralistic sensibility, the acknowledgement that you can learn from a variety of different perspectives. You can learn from folk you disagree with. Accept their insight, call into question their conclusion, and stay in contact with their humanity. Very important these days. So we've got a lot. Very important these days. Oh, oh, oh yes. Very much so. Very much so. You are sketching for us the contours of your vision, values. Let's put the catastrophic back in. Yes. And give us the heart of the picture. Yeah, this is, this is for me um, something that's very is fundamental, really. I, uh, it has to do with not just the problem of evil, and by evil I mean unmerited harm and undeserved pain, uh, but it's, it's, it's the catastrophe of evil, the monstrosity of injustice, uh, the calamity of indifference and callousness toward those who are suffering, you see. And uh, I accepted a long time ago a, a particular kind of calling. It's a calling real small c. Brother Skip and I have been wrestling with this since Yale's 1984, and Brother Bobo understands what I'm talking about too, because he's a black man, been wrestling with his sharp mind and sensibility as a social scientist. And that's a challenge. Social scientists. Yeah, because social science these days tends to want to hold at arm's length the catastrophic until the crisis is inescapable and only talk about the problem that we can solve right now in incrementally. You say, oh, yes, okay, we got some problems, but you know what? There's never been a Negro problem in America. It's been a catastrophe visited on black people. Slavery wasn't a Negro problem. Jim Crow, Jane Crow wasn't a Negro problem. New Jim Crow. Not a Negro prop. I got a note from Brother Tef Poe. I don't know whether he made it here or not, but he's, he, but he's down in Ferguson. Same is true with Sister Burcell, uh, my, my dear sister uh, Derricka. Ferguson's not a problem. It's a catastrophe. There's human beings down there. There's precious folk down there. There's never been a woman's problem. No, it's a catastrophe. Jewish problem? No, it's a catastrophe. 1492. The 1945, the expulsion of Jews in Spain, and then 45, indescribable evil of the Holocaust. That's a catastrophe. Palestinian problem. That's not a problem. The Israeli occupation is a catastrophe. You have to talk about it in those terms, even as you keep track of the humanity of our precious Jewish brothers and sisters who have to deal with 2,000 years of catastrophic backdrop. Do we have the spiritual courage to love both Jewish brothers and sisters and Palestinian brothers and sisters and do it in such a way that we preserve morality, spirituality, and integrity? Now, that's my tradition. Now, granted that uh, for me, it, 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 it's, it, it's informed very much by, by music because I think that uh, going back to Vico, mm. going back to Vico, Vico begins with humando, Latin burial, we beans on the way to Death, our body, the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. Very soon, very soon, and the level of sorrow and suffering that flows from catastrophe usually first takes the form of song at its most sophisticated. There's a wonderful rabbinical insight that talks about response to sorrow. First tears, then silence, then song. Very important. So we're getting to the prophetic how part of the story. It, exactly, and, and how we wrestle with the catastrophe in such a way that we preserve our fallibilism, we preserve our sensibility to each other's viewpoint, but at the same time, a willingness to take a risk, a yeah. willingness to take a risk. I think one of the real challenges of young brothers and sisters of all colors the younger generation, even though there's a wonderful moral and spiritual awakening taking place, is that for the last 40 years, young people have been taught to be obsessed with success. 
up with mobility, status, power, wealth, and not obsessed with greatness. And by greatness, I'm not talking about Alexander the Great. <laughs> he or she is greatest among you will try to tell the truth, bear witness. Think critically for yourself. Allow others to think critically for themselves. The anthem of black people, lift every voice, not echo. Be an original, not a copy. Crucial. And that music for me sets the real um, standard though, you know. That's, that's the John Coltrane is the... Is and the that music. is risky music. Sarah that's Vaughan, music Sarah on Vaughan. the edge. That's but right. so... That's Donnie Hathaway, you know. I want to hear about your risk taking too. Oh yes. Oh Lord, yeah. Well, I'll talk about your risk taking. Absolutely. So you have been taking risks for decades, but talk about it that way. Talk about, pick a, pick a case, pick a story where you made the decision, this is a risk I'm gonna take, here's why, here's the prophetic work I'm doing. You talk about the alarm bell. Mm. Just mm. Tell us about a moment of risk taking of your own. Yeah, I tell you, I got a lot to choose from. I know, uh, I know you do, and it's, it's, a it's, a it's a way of life. It's a way of life for you. It's but true. give us. I could begin when Brother Martin was shot. Fourteen. I was a track star. My brother was one of the greatest in the history of. God bless you, little brother. One of the greatest in the history of track and field. But I was obsessed with running, and I was hitting tapes all the time. And when Brother Martin got shot, it just changed my life. I'd heard him speak when I was 10, and he had moved me at a very deep level. In fact, he moved me the way, the way in which David Ruff and Temptations did, and that's very deep, especially as a young person. And, uh, and, and, and I decided to uh, fight for black studies in high schools. So we just shut down all the high schools in Sacramento, California. I was student body president of Kennedy High at that time, and they said I wouldn't graduate. I said, well, I got to do what I got to do. <laughs> and so that was the beginning, you know, at 14. And then, uh, of course, when we were here at Harvard, we took over the president's office. And I do that under very specific circumstances and conditions. Make sure you have your morality in place and so forth. But we did that in relation to Say Angola. Say more about that. Say more about well, it's that. Very that, important what is because, that yeah, practice? because the thing is, is that the, uh, you see, it, it's so easy to become self righteous in your struggle against evil. Uh, the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. But if even something you consider evil and other people might be a bit complacent, uh, it doesn't give you the right just to engage in name calling and finger pointing. Because everybody wakes up at different times. And nobody arrives with advanced consciousness as if Malcolm X just appeared out of his precious mama's <laughs> Wound. Malcolm X, no, he was a gangster called Malcolm Little and Elijah loved him in a cell and he turned that cell into a library and became a different person and he even grew in relation to Elijah. Well, that's courage. That's intellectual courage. That's moral courage and so forth and so on. And so uh, uh, the important thing is in engaging these conflicts and stuff. I mean, a, a good example is what's going on right now here with the strike. Here with the strike. Can we have the kind of robust both conversation where you got folk putting their lives on the line with the strike and at the same time you're, you're acknowledging the conflict? The beautiful thing is the young people recognize the crucial role that our precious workers play in your lives. And yet at the same time, I should say quite honestly, because I've only met my dear sister uh, Drew Faust one time. But she strikes me as a person who's got decency and integrity. So the question becomes, well, how do you engage in this struggle, this conflict in such a way that you can reach a fair agreement without demonizing any side? That's a challenge. Larry Katz, I've known Brother Larry for a while. I heard he's, going, he's jumping in. We're going to see. Now, I met Brother Ed. Where's Brother Ed? There he is right there. I had Brother Ed and Brian and the others leading the charge. We've done so many things together and I always like to be in solidarity with you. And of course I endorse what's going on, but I want to do it in such a way that paideia informs what takes place so that the rich humanity of working people affirmed what the context is in terms of Harvard 
acknowledged, and then the various leaders on both sides you ascribe based on your own experience. What does that Decency, mean? integrity. Okay. Decency, and, but see, I've only known, you know, I've only, I've only met one time and I've seen decency and integrity uh, on her part. And I know Larry Katz, we work together, definitely. Now, you know, when it comes to other presidents, I might have a different view about that. I was that. gonna say, I was gonna say, let's, uh, let's talk about Absolutely. that. No, I, let's no, talk about oh, that. no, I love Larry Summers as a brother. No, well, I didn't brother, mean that president. So I wasn't going to talk about that president. I don't think we to talk about that president. not at the same level as Sister Drew, but no, go right ahead. I was talking about Barack. Oh, Brother Barack. Oh, I love that brother, too. Well, and, you know, you've also gone out there taking some serious risks in things you've said. You know, the most controversial recent one, I guess, Republican and blackface. Yeah, okay. Rockefeller. Rockefeller Republican. Oh, okay. Okay. So tell us about how that reconciles with Paideia. Oh, it does, because... Line 24A of Plato's Apology, the cause of my unpopularity is parhesia. Plain speech, frank speech, fearless speech, unintimidated speech, it will get you in trouble. It got Socrates in trouble. And to be honest in public, now given the corporate media, just to be honest in public for a second is a breakthrough <laughs> because it's so commodified and it's so dumbed down and so forth. But no, it began, of course, you know, I did 65 events for Brother Barack. I worked very closely uh, with him to try to push him over the line. But when I saw him invite Tim Geithner, Wall Street Extension, Brother Larry Summers at that time, I mean, he's changing, and it's interesting to see him change, and everybody can change, which is beautiful. But, it's, but you know, a deregulator and so forth, bringing in all of Wall Street, I said, wait a minute, I'm here because I'm trying to build on the legacy of Martin King. Martin King said what? There's going to be four challenges for American democracy already slide down the slippery slope to chaos. You're going to have to come to terms with poverty. You're going to have to come to terms with racism and various forms of xenophobia. And these days includes anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, as well as anti-black or white or Jewish or indigenous people. He said you're going to come to terms with militarism, imperial policy. And you're going to come to terms with materialism, which is a cultural and a spiritual condition, viewing life as a gold rush and ending up worshiping the golden calf. That's what Martin said. That's my tradition. Mm -hmm. So when I, when, I, when, I, when I first talked to Brother Barack, because you remember he gave a speech right here in Boston, and he said, America is a beautiful place. And I said, this brother's going to have a Christopher Columbus experience. <laughs> He's going to discover America, <laughs> a magical place. <laughs> and I told him right on the phone, I said, my dear brother, America is free and democratic to the degree to which it creates citizens, not just consumers, courageous, critical human beings who are willing to keep it free and democratic every generation. If they don't do it, you lose it. You're going to end up with a crypto fascist America. Nothing, the laws of history in terms of the role of complacency and cowardice and apathy rule in America too. Plato's great critique of democracy. Show me a democracy and what? I'll show you a group of people who are driven by so much unruly passion and pervasive ignorance that it will produce a tyrant. That's Plato. That's why we wrestle with Plato. Not his conclusions. We don't need philosopher kings. The critique is powerful then and now. So, so when, I, when, I, when I called Barack, when he called me, we talked for four and a half hours. And I asked him, brother, what is your relation to the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and Martin Luther King Jr.? That's how I roll. That's how I roll. I could have said Curtis Mayfield and Nina Simone, but I didn't want to shift too quick. That's my tradition. Could have said John Dewey. Could have said Muriel Rukeyser. I could have said Adrian Rich. Could have said Noam Chomsky. Whole host of others, you see. And he said, No, Brother West, I can, I can assure you that I'm very much concerned with this legacy and I'm going to keep it alive. I said, Okay, then we're going to fight together. When he started bringing in the Wall Street folk, when he preserved the foreign policy team of George Bush, when he said there would be no, no investigation of those who engaged in torture, that's a crime against humanity. The first essay I ever wrote in my professional life was against torture. You don't turn your back if you committed the rule of law. And the same was true with surveillance. 
And then, of course, the fact that the issue of poverty didn't surface at all in the seven and a half years. What is it now? Black child poverty, 46% under six years old. That's for me. That's a moral disgrace. That's a crime against humanity. You got a black president. You got a Black Lives Matter movement. What does that say? Well, I'm just president of everybody. I'm not president of just black America. I agree. I agree. But you know what? Black folk in America. And you know what? It was black women especially that pushed you over. And it's their children that you're talking about. When Sister Michelle Obama said, I'm in a White House built by slaves. You should have said also black slaves. You see? But she was courageous. I salute my sister. But what did she go on to do? Then she said, my girls wake up in that house. I said, that's beautiful. That's magnificent. But you know what? 44% of the children under six who are the descendants of those slaves, they wake up in shacks every morning. And if you lose sight of them, all the obsession with the upper middle class black people is narrow, truncated, and it makes the boys turn over in his grave. That's my tradition. So then when I said that, but oh, Wes hating on the prison. No, I hate injustice. I don't hate the brother. And as, his, as he began to move through his presidency, you know, the vicious attacks on him, and of course, in the name of the truth, you've got to defend him against lies and mendacity and so forth. My God, I, I defend Clarence Thomas against lies and mendacity. The police were beating up Clarence Thomas the way they do some of these young folk. I would defend Clarence and tell him, this is a solidarity for the moment. I hate white supremacy. <laughs> I hate white supremacy. Based on principle, I'm with you, brother. But you know, 98% of the time, you siding with the rich, the powerful, the indifferent, and the callous. Thank you, brother Wes. I need to help at the moment. We'll have a dialogue later. <laughs> you got to try to proceed based on principle in that sense. And so that's my, my so when I called him, you know, what, what, what else did I call him? My puppet of Wall Street. I forget all the things that I said. <laughs> puppet of Wall Street. Now, the language, you know, was hyperbolic. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> but it's part of your prophetic style, is it? But you know, I mean, sometimes I go too far, but my problem is, is that, um, you know, Brother Malcolm used to say, and he had so much love for black folks, so much love for poor people, that he used to say, when you're sitting on the stove, it's hard to be sweet and polite sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the harshness of the conditions, Roxbury and Dorchester, south side of Chicago, poor whites in Appalachia, brown brothers and sisters wrestling with what's going on with the border shifting and so on in Texas and what have you. White working class brothers who oftentimes are now you know, attracted by Trump because they're catching hell, but they've got too many xenophobic blinders and therefore ending up uh, supporting a, 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 a proto-crypto fascist, I think. Uh, you say to yourself, well, sometimes you will use a language that when you look back and you're a little cooler, you say, ooh, that was a little harsh. <laughs> but if the truth is one of stinging, you see, come from a tradition, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> and there's sting in the swing. And the swing is intellectual swinging. What kind of analysis do you have? Are you looking at the world through the lens of those who are dominated and so forth? What kind of orientation do you have? Are you willing to take a risk? Are you willing to pay a cost? And I'm not saying martyrdom, even though some of us must be willing to die. And of course, you know, I had so many death threats, I can't count them. And my dear wife, Leslie, you know, she, she prays for me and so forth. And every prayer is not answered, but that's all right. Uh, that's true for all of us. You never know when you're going to go. But if you die, as the great Heschel says in his essay on piety, it's a privilege to die if you're following your calling, because your life is a gift anyway, and all you're doing is giving it back. That's all. So in that sense, that the attempt to follow through on what one's called to do, intellectually, morally, politically, spiritually, for me is uh, crucial. So there's a lot of kinds of faith that lift you up in this, and faith in critical temper, in critique, in that work, that's a part of it. Yes, yes, yes. Faith in prophetic pragmatism, 
faith in the traditions, the many traditions that you, that live through you, that you recreate in your own performance being enactments. You also talk about democratic faith. Oh, yeah. Faith in the capacity of a democratic people to get it right at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Through struggle. This feels like a moment that's challenging our faith, that democratic faith. Well, it, what do we do about that now? No, I appreciate that question. See, I would say, in fact, that um, the history of the United States, uh, in many ways, uh, up until the last 40 years, uh, exemplified what the great de Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. That's why ma the majority vote has little to do with democracy. If you don't have counter institution, you don't have counter majoritarian institution to defend rights and liberties. And what I mean by that is, if a democracy predicated on slavery, democracy predicated on Jim Crow and Jane Crow, patriarchal households, trashing gay brothers, lesbian sisters, trashing bisexuals and transgender, then our faith should have been already one that was shaken. Because that's the history of the fragile experiment in democracy. Now granted, since the 1960s, we've had unbelievable breakthroughs, but the breakthrough had to do with courageous, critical folk who are willing to reshape the world, reshape the United States. You see. And then, of course, we got backlash with Nixon, 68, and thereafter. You see. Uh, so that these days with Trump, you know, this sense of somehow fetishizing Trump and somehow viewing him some, as, as alien, if we could somehow just overcome Trump, we can get back to business as usual. No, business as usual is still catastrophic for a whole lot of folk whole lot of folk, you see. Now, that's not to say Trump is not dangerous or beyond dangerous. Of course he is. Well, I shouldn't say of course he is. I don't want to be uh, axiomatic here. I would want to hear your counter-argument as to how he's not <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> I want to be open to dialogue here to everybody because, I mean, I fight for the right of my dear brother Rush Limbo to be wrong. I'm a libertarian on that issue, strong. But I don't want us to think that somehow it's just this moment where things are, 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 are going over the cliff. Now, it's true that we're closer to going off to the cliff now than we've been in a while, and I do How do you measure with. that? How do you measure that? I measure that in terms of the complicity of the media, the rule of big money, the commodification of everything, where everything is for sale, everybody is for sale, so that notions of integrity, honesty, decency, and courage become countercultural in such a society, in such a world, you see. And uh, uh, when I look at uh, the TV and how they covered every Twitter and every Facebook and every speech of Trump, what do you got, 86 minutes for every 23 seconds my dear brother Bernie Sanders got? Oh, how sad, how sad. You see. Bernie Sanders had something to say. He may have been repetitive, that's all right. <laughs> I love my brother. I respect my brother. I disagree with him making the move that he's made with, with Sister Hillary. You know, all he had to say was, Sister Hillary's better than Brother Donald. That's all he had to say. And he said, well, she's making an outstanding president. No, you're going too far. You're going too far. You're going too far man. She really believes in a lot of things I do. No, she does that. She's merely vanilla. She's merely vanilla. She lip sings and says she does. Will she really do it? I don't think so. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I said, neoliberal politicians act. Make those progressive gestures to bring in the black folk, bring in the poor folk, bring in the work, the labor movement. The labor movement supported her before she even made a progressive move. I'm very critical of them. Brother Ed, I want you to tell your labor brothers and sisters, even though I endorse the strike, brother, they have been wrong on the national level a lot of the times. They move too quickly. You agree? I'm with you, though. That doesn't make us right, but we think we're right. And we're going to fight for that right, but, I, I, I'm, I, but that's very important because we have to be critical of our comrades. We have to interrogate our comrades in that sense. And so if, is Hillary well, much better than... Well, than, let's uh, take two different scenarios. Yes. Trump yeah. for president, Clinton president. Oh, <laughs> All right, so what, what does prophetic pragmatism do 
in Trump world or Clinton world? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do, Leslie and I are gonna have cognac. <laughs> That's what we're gonna do. I'll do it in the name of Jesus and she'll do it in the name of Yahweh, but uh, uh, we're gonna have some drink first to get fortified. And Skip gonna steal away with Bobo and Marcy and get fortified. We'll invite you too, you know. All right, good. After that, we'll have to do the same thing. We'll have to still engage in our attempt to tell the truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak, but just as necessary, not a sufficient condition. We'll still have to be willing to be more courageous. With Trump, it means that the attacks will be raw, crude, ugly, and I think more and more neo fascist and crypto fascist which is that danger beyond danger that you're talking about, you mm -hmm. see. Uh, with Hillary, if Hillary wins, I will celebrate Hillary's victory, in the same way I celebrated Brother Barack's victory in terms of it being a blow against the vicious legacy of male supremacy. At the level of symbolic appearance, that still counts. I got a precious daughter, and I already see the impact, and the impact of young kids of all colors, but disproportionately chocolate that Barack and, and, and Michelle and, and the two precious daughters have. That's important, but don't confuse the symbolic with the substantial. So when Hillary wins, I'm gonna be first accenting poor people here. I'm gonna be putting tremendous pressure on her vis-a-vis -vis her relation to Brother Netanyahu. She said she's gonna invite Netanyahu the first week or two. I said, oh, you're gonna triumph over Trump and then bring a Trump-like figure from Israel to the White House. What's going on? I thought you were against xenophobia across the board. Lieberman and Uriel, these folk, are not, they're right-wing, xenophobic Jewish brothers and sisters. And we've got to be in solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters, even as we're critical of their leadership when they engage in various attacks on innocent people. And we have to stand with our progressive Jewish brothers and sisters who have been there over and over again trying to tell the truth and yet push back. Mm -hmm. I met the brother who's working with you. What's his name? Omar is right Yeah, he, this brother right here, we just met, we had a wonderful conversation. It's been the first 27 years in Israel. Is that right, my brother? Truth teller on this issue, getting in deep trouble. <laughs> we understand. We need to be in solidarity based on principle, integrity, and so on. And that's crucial, and the, the kind of awakening that's taking place among the younger generation of all colors, Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives being, coming together with not just those who are under occupation in, 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 in Israel, but Kashmir and other places, a cosmopolitan, international, global perspectives that then can inform what we do because we're up against so much. So I think we're gonna be up against a lot with, with Sister Hillary. So my last, last question from me and then we'll turn it over here. But on the substance, I mean, you were involved in the Democratic platform writing. Talk about that. What, you know, did you make any differences that you think matter? Did it feel like a pointless exercise? Oh, yeah. what's, your, what's your take? It was a beautiful experience. I mean, it's rare that you get a chance to get on the inside of one of these uh, elite-driven, corporate-dominated political parties. <laughs> and the fact that they gave me a space, I mean, that Brother Bernie was very kind to put me on the committee. Of course, when he put me on, you know, a lot of hell broke loose and so forth. <laughs> but uh, uh, he put me on, he knew that I'm don't, I don't have a fundamental loyalty to the Democratic Party. And I told him the first day, I said, I come as teacher and citizen, I'm dedicated to the truth and justice as I understand it. Period. Could you say something about the Democratic Party? No, no, I said what I got to say. <laughs> but you're sitting on our platform committee. I know. I, I, I appreciate the invitation. <laughs> appreciate the invitation. So we fuse. We call for no fracking across the board. We call for opposition to TPP. We call for a $15 minimum wage. We call for Medicare for all. We call for at least a mentioning of the Israeli occupation and settlement within the platform. We lost on all of those. Each and every one of them, we lost. And they got the word directly from the White House as well as Hillary Clinton. We said, well, wait a minute, Hillary Clinton opposes TPP now, but embarrassed the president. Well, we saw about the embarrassment, but can you take a stance and embarrass the president every once in a while? No, we don't do that kind of thing, Brother West. I do. 
I supported it, of course, when, when the platform was voted on. I abstained. How can you abstain? We met six different times in different cities. We had 142 witnesses. It was a magnificent process just to see Bob Moses on the, with his stick at 82 years old, one of the great freedom fighters going back to Mississippi in the 60s and so forth to give his reflection and to see William Barber, who is the most Martin Luther King-like figure in it's this true. country today. You all know Reverend true. William yeah. Barber from North Carolina. <laughs> you see, to bring them in it was magnificent. But then, you know, we lost. And so uh, uh, the, the, when they finally voted on it and Brother Bernie said we were going to take it to the floor, I was looking forward to going to the floor. Then he changed his mind on that. I said, ooh, Brother Bernie, I still love you, but you're so wrong. You're so wrong. We need to take this thing to the floor in Philadelphia. No, no, no. Okay, okay. So that uh, 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 I, then I knew, you know, that I had to uh, make my own decision in terms of lifting my own voice and respecting other people who lift their own voices. So people who support Hillary are very critical and so forth. They want to, want to do it to keep Trump away from the White House. I can thoroughly understand that and so forth. But I still hold on to Sister Jill Stein. Why? Because I don't think my vote is going to be the decisive one in the country. And therefore, I want to let her know that we're trying to build something beyond the two-party system that oftentimes is just so narrow and parochial and provincial regarding the democratic energies of the demos. And it's back to this issue of faith. Mm -hmm. You see, this almost Pascalian wager on the capacity of those who I don't call everyday people to govern themselves. It's a hell of a leap of faith, the democratic leap of faith and action. But it's the best we fallible human beings can do in a world that has been so driven by organized greed and indifference and callousness that often resulted in monarchies and suzerains and a whole host of subjects who were dominated as opposed to citizens who tried to rule themselves. And my great teacher Sheldon Wolin, PhD, 1950 here under the great Samuel Beer, calls it fugitive democracy. The best organized demos can ever do. It's just organize and mobilize and bring power and pressure to bear, but old oligarchs and plutocrats are so powerful, they will either kill you, they will co-opt you, or they will marginalize you, or they will incarcerate you. The Oscar Lopez Rivera's and Mumia Abu Jamal's and others in that sense. And so what you do is you continually try to rise up. It's, that's what's tragic comic about it. It's almost like Sisyphus. You rise up and put pressure to bear knowing that in the end, the police and the army and the COINTELPRO and the FBI and the CIA that have that kind of tremendous power will try to crush you. That's why you have to have your spirit intact, you have to have your morality intact, you have to have your friends in solidarity. A lot of people often raise, how do you escape Gates? How do you escape Gates from so close? Everybody knows you kind of revolutionary and Brother Skip is a strong liberal. I said, yes, I love my brother. We struggle over it, but when you're down and out, as a revolutionary, you need friends. And friendship cuts deeper than politics and ideology or religion or skin pigmentation or sexual orientation and so forth. You see. Because it's, so, it's serious business. It's very serious business to try to make sense of the world, to try to love beauty and love goodness, and love justice. Love your neighbor, and of course, as a Christian, I try to love my enemies. You know, and I'll do that on my own. I need a lot of grace, capital G, for that. <laughs> but I try to and do the best of my ability. Why? Because you don't spend too much time on them if you already acknowledge something potentially good about them. You're focusing on the issues rather than just them. And you're getting that resentment and revenge out of your soul so you can focus on justice and love. Very, very different. And the major challenge of the younger generation as the righteous indignation escalates is will it be channeled? Love and justice as opposed to hatred and revenge. Martin King says justice is what love looks like in public. And Niebuhr says any justice that's only justice is rescued by something deeper than justice, namely love. And love is a steadfast commitment to the welfare of others, especially the weak and vulnerable. And from there, you then have your debates that are very subtle and mm -hmm. sophisticated and so forth and so on about what kind of philosophical 
conceptions of the good society. The great John Rawls was wrestling with all his life, and Tim Scanlon's been wrestling with this so much of his life. And then what kind of action will follow there, there from? Let's, uh, let's hear from everybody else. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I know you got to run. <laughs> you all are so kind to come out today. Exactly. Let's start over here. Thank you, Brother Wes. Thank you, my brother. I want to, you mentioned at the end um, your little discourse on love and justice, quoting King and Niebuhr, and speaking as, as a recovering lawyer who did politics and policy and been in ministry mm. for 20 years. Um, what can you say to the American Christian community, whether you want to use the Christian left, the Christian right, or large, about how we avoid being, because the same co-opted in the way that political forces, um, parties are co-opted by our system. Likewise, churches so often uh, fear the prophetic That's right. because of their internal concerns and so on. So what advice or encouragement would you give to us in that level? I think part of it has to do with just acknowledging that in a society in which big money rules and market sensibilities are ubiquitous, you're going to end up with market religion. It could be market Christianity, market Judaism, market Buddhism, market Hinduism. Uh, and by market, what I mean fundamentally is concerned about uh, uh, upward mobility so that blessings become something to receive as opposed to being a blessing to others. So that love is reduced to narrow conceptions of justice, uh, of charity, and trump and foreclose any conceptions about justice. Maybe I shouldn't have said Trump. I said, let me just say I foreclose. I have to cut that yeah, word <laughs> Exactly. That's all I got to it's meet very you. Very awkward. It's awkward. The fork. And so what has happened, of course, in the last 40 years is that we've got pervasive market religiosity. And therefore, it's the, the, the marginalizing of prophetic witness, the legacies of Dorothy Day. And now, there's, now thank God for the Pope. Pope Francis has said some wonderful wonderful things, and I resonate with him. I'm still critical of his organization. It's too hierarchical and patriarchal and so forth. Uh, but uh, he said wonderful things and in, 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 in supportive of, of poor and working people. Uh, and that is very important. But I hope that there is a, a, a reawakening in churches and mosques and synagogues. Thank you. As well as outside. Yeah. Hello. Ooh, that's loud. Hi. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. West. I probably will be telling my grandchildren one day about this moment, so I'm super excited. Um, but you talked about this kind of cliff that we've been approaching and the need to pull back from it. And my concern is my duty that extends further than this political race, meaning if we do succeed in pulling back from the xenophobic racist cliff that has been approaching us, I do not want to forget or unacknowledge that rise of that prejudice that we've seen in America quite recently, that such a bright and kind of illuminatory light has been shined on. I don't want to forget that that still exists. And I want to approach those people who have kind of supported Trump and such politicians in a way that's not dehumanizing to them, in a way that acknowledges their dignity. How can I do that as a citizen if such members of a group might not acknowledge my own humanity as well? Mm. Yes, yes, yes. But I think uh, morality, as I, as I understand it, when it comes to how we think and act, is not a quid pro quo affair, you see. That you're doing what is right because you believe it is right. And your witness will leave the world just a little better than you found it. That doesn't mean that the response to you is going to be equivalent or reciprocal in that sense. For example, with, 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 uh, with Brother Barack, I mean, I still spoke in the churches, black churches all around, and I would tell them over and over again, I don't say what I say in order for black people to love me. I love black people because they're worthy of being loved, and I want to tell the truth and bear witness. If only two of them love me back, I'm still breakdancing. <laughs> I'm happy because it's not 
to be popular. You know what I mean? And so it is in our individual lives. So it is in our interpersonal lives and so on. Because the question will be your own accountability of yourself, your answerability to yourself. And what kind of person have I chosen to be and I'm going to do this whether they do it or not. See, that's why Martin Luther King could say he still loved Bull O'Connor. Bull O'Connor was a Sunday school teacher whose folk killed four precious black girls in Sunday school. Now, Martin, what are you doing loving Bull? I don't love what he did. He's a gangster. He's a thug. But I don't want to add more hate to the world. I want to be like Emma Till's mother that said, I don't have a minute to hate. I'll pursue justice for the rest of my life. She didn't say, I want to kill the thugs who dropped my baby in Tallahatchie River. No, we well, see, that's the tradition that one chooses, as it were, and it's true for any human being, but I'm talking about black folk now. And that's, I think, something that's a, uh, very precious, very precious. And sometimes it's just a matter of, of piety. And by piety, I mean acknowledging the debts of those who came before to put a smile on your grandmama's face. You gave so much and sacrificed so deeply so that you would be a person of integrity, not just a graduate of Harvard. <laughs> I mean, she's glad you're graduating, but <laughs> you come out of Harvard and still gangster-like, she's not proud of you. That's a, that's a high standard. And we, you know, we all have it within our families, our non-religious traditions, secular traditions, religious, whatever it is. We have it among our professors. I want to be a professor like this, who pushes me, takes me seriously, disagrees with me because I'm taught in that way. And then try to build on. That's why I started by mentioning my teachers and my Sunday school teachers and my family because that's what goes into us. In the same way you got the same rich stuff going into you. Is that right? I hope so. Oh, yes, you do. I can, I can feel your spirit. Indeed, indeed. Absolutely. Brother West, um, I'm wondering how we can resist the temptation for incrementalism, um, the risk that we acknowledge um, the suspectness of mass incarceration without acknowledging that perhaps incarceration itself as a concept, prison itself as a concept is suspect, how we can prevent ourselves from being just satisfied with recognizing individual Palestinian home demolitions as suspect without actually challenging the whole governmental construct of occupation itself. How do we um, fight these individual struggles without cutting, precluding the possibility that actually we're still functioning within unjust systems. Mm, yeah, I appreciate that. I think there's different uh, degrees and gradations of critical interrogation and scrutiny and examination. And it's true, you can, act, you can accent an isolated evil. You can connect it to other forms. And by evil, I'm talking about structures of domination when people have no security from domination. See? No security from domination at all. You see? And begin to make the analysis, so you end up with a more systemic analysis, what people call structural analyses. And that's very difficult. I mean, it's much easier said than done, but it, the attempt must be made. The attempt must be, be made. But as you know, a lot of times it takes a lot for people to uh, actually respond to just one major structural domination, you see. And so it takes a while to begin to allow for that overflow. But this is what Pi Day and Learning How to Die is all about, is shatter our parochial, provincial analysis and begin to look and see structurally what is going on around the world. What is the relation of the military coup in Honduras in 2009 and the U.S. government? Why is it that all those bombs that drones, U.S. drones have dropped on innocent people don't surface? How many children have really died? The government told us there were no civilians at all. Quit lying. Then we were told, oh, it's just 64. Are you sure? You see, those are the kind of questions. That's what Heschel and King and Dorothy Day and others, so it is these days that we have to raise. And this is true because a baby in Yemen and Somalia, a baby in Afghanistan and Pakistan has exactly the same value as a baby in Cambridge. Um, hi, th thank you so much for your uh, talk today. Um, so I have a question that, you know, I know a lot of Harvard students want to work in government and you could say, I guess, within the system, but um, I was wondering like, how do you keep that 
idealism and not just like sell yourself in this like age of, of campaign finance. And um, what I specifically mean is that, so, you know, you, you, when you go into government and or I've, I've worked in local government and everything, but when you work in like government um, and you take large risks, you can, it's not as rewarded because, you know, of, of all the campaign financing, the money you need. So like, I guess my question is how do you make sure that you're idealistic and, and you know, actually making change, but not just, you know, kicked out because you said something controversial in an election or something. Yeah, I appreciate the question. But it's very much like being a student at Harvard, though. There ought to be some connection between town and gown. Because it's not just one context. You want to be multi-contextual. You're a student here at Harvard, you got some other things in the community. You work for the government, you got some other things on the weekend. You got a lot going on in your life. You know what I mean? There's no way you can confine yourself to primarily one context if you're trying to be a force for good. See? Of course, you have your kids and family and what have you, but uh, all of us have to make prudential, we talked before about prudence versus opportunism, prudential choices. And we all have to deal with that. But I would think that Harvard students wouldn't have to worry too much about that because just by being at Harvard, you're already wrestling with certain kinds of challenges and choices that you have to make in order to accent your wisdom and prudence as opposed to just opportunism. If you see the opportunism, opportunism becoming too hegemonic, time for Socratic energy. Time for some serious critique and self-criticism and criticism of others. So that in that regard, I think there's a variety of different contexts that you can feel confined, but in another context, you can stretch out. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Brother West, for the thank words. You, I have a question uh, pertaining to your description of faith and democracy yes. and that point. And coming out recently, a major event, obviously the Brexit poll, or just this last week, Hungary actually failing to pass this referendum to potentially deny refugees. And everybody breathes a sigh of relief, relief when the democratic process is halted on these kind of issues. And moving into this American election, I, I'm curious as to how you would describe a language that has faith in democracy amidst global uh, neoliberalism. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. But keep in mind, uh, majority vote does not equal democracy, a point that I made before. The Tocqueville and others have taught us well on this. And referendums, in fact, New York Times a day talked about referendums are not always the major vehicles for democratic ways of being in the world. You could take a vote in this country right now on the lives of our precious transgender folk. Which way you think they're gonna go? It's not going to be good for our precious transgender folk because the prejudices are so deep that a, a majority vote can reinforce some ugly domination. So there's got to be some commitment to the integrity, decent dignity, and I would say even sanctity of persons, <coughs> independent of just democratic majority vote. And that's part the history of black folk I was talking about, the history of indigenous peoples, you see, where you had majority votes going on and on and on. And if black people had put Brown v. Board, 1954, to a majority vote, what do you think we'd get? You just read Talking with Strangers and see that. My dear sister's marvelous text. You see. And same would be true with executive order for the uh, Lincoln's executive order. That wasn't majority vote. If we had majority vote, it would, would, probably wouldn't have gone through. So that same is true in other parts of the world. Look at, uh, what is it, Columbia right now, uh, dealing with uh, the legacy of the government and guerrilla fighting and so forth, you put it up to a vote, boom, backfires on them in a certain sense. That doesn't mean that you give up on the capacities of everyday people to govern themselves, but governing oneself is not just a matter of majority vote. People governing themselves is not just a matter of majority vote, you see. So that's the beginnings of an answer to your question. I'm not doing justice to it, though, because that's a very complex one, though. Professor, yes. is it your view that it would have been a good thing, a very good thing indeed, if we had never had slavery in this country, if not a single African had been forcibly removed from the motherland by anybody, 
that they'd all stayed put where they so richly deserved to be. That when you compare the history of blacks in this country, the good and the bad, the good does not outweigh the bad. Is that your view? And what would be the black population in this country had we never had slavery, Mm. Professor? Boy, that's some serious counterfactual thinking. (laughs) Hypothetical. Well, one thing we ought to acknowledge, though, is that any time you hear people talking about slavery as America's original sin, that's not true. The original sin was the treatment of indigenous peoples. Land dispossessed, babies, mothers, fathers. That was also white supremacist. African slavery was number two, still barbaric, but number two. So that we still would have a critique of a precious democratic experiment predicated on barbaric treatment of our indigenous peoples without black folk, without black folk. That meant there wouldn't have been any black cowboys as part of the expansion, subordinating indigenous peoples. Now, to imagine the United States without black people, good God almighty. Well, Ralph Ellison tried that. Yeah, Ralph tried that in his wonderful essay, uh, The Marriage Without Blacks, you know. No blues, no jazz, no Aretha. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> no James Bowen. Uh, but then all the suffering that, that, that you're trying to get us to keep track of. It's very difficult to engage in that kind of hypothetical uh, thinking. We are where we are. We got to work with where we are. And we have to proceed in such a way that we're still committed to the... Uh, humanity and individuality of each and every one of us, no matter what color. So I can't give a direct answer to your question, but I just think that it's so counterfactual, it's hard to conceive of what an answer would look like, especially an answer I think that would do justice to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. West. Um, I'm from South Africa, and the situation is catastrophic. Uh, the status quo looks like three, 63% of black South Africans living in poverty. Mm. And I want to oppose the status quo and contribute to destroying it. Can you tell me how I can maintain the courage to do that when I know that that might entail me losing the little that I have under the current system mm. um, and the little that has been afforded to me and you know, putting the lives and, you know, of people that I love at risk? Yes, yes, ooh, it's a heartfelt question. And I could never provide a, a, an answer from my position and vantage point because it's gonna be up to you to make that close reading. What are the live options available? How do I balance love of family, love of principles? What kind of profession do I have? What is, how is that connected to my calling? See, none of that I can answer for you. You've got to answer for you. Now, there is a brother who invited me to South Africa. Is he still here? Uh, he invited me to give the Nelson Mandela lecture about 2006. And uh, I talked about the Santa Clausification of Mandela on television, so I got in a lot of trouble, you know. <laughs> Every road, every bridge named that the Mandela. I said, what, what about some of the other freedom fighters? Zimbabwe, I mean, uh, Robert, uh, what's the great one who had his special sale? Robert, uh, yes, yes, my God, what a giant, you see. Honey, McNair, we can go on and on and on. But what happened was very much what, what they've done to Martin here, you see, is that you can turn him into Santa Claus with a big smile on his face, not a threat to anybody, toys in his bag, hand it out so everybody got a smile. Mm. You see, and I said, in my lecture on television, one of the first steps is to be Socratic in relation to Mandela's neoliberal rule that brought in the big corporations. We can understand why he did it, but let's be honest about it. He went from revolutionary with indescribable courage and vision to neoliberals. When you walk into the Mandela Foundation, what do you see? The first thing you see, these pictures of Bill Clinton and all these quotes from Bill Clinton. What's Bill Clinton doing in <laughs> What the heck is going on? You, you've been there, you see. 
I said, this is ridiculous. But it's the neoliberalization of our dear brother, in part because he himself ruled with the political equality so crucial, breaking the back of barbaric apartheid. But then the class questions, the relation to multinational corporations and big banks and so forth. And what do you get in South Africa? A black middle class, unprecedented, devastated black working class, devastated black poor. Sound familiar in the United States? It's not exactly an analogy, but it overlaps in a significant way. And the last thing I want is just to see black middle class folk walking around like they some kind of uh, 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 peacocks. You know, look at me, look at me. I'm the first, I'm the second, I'm the third. I say peacocks strut because they can't fly. I come from a float who fly away in Ellison's short story, flying away like an eagle, keeping track of what's going on. Strong as the eagle, concerned with the folk catching hell. Don't tell me about the class ceiling. I'm also concerned about those in the basement. That's what's happening in South Africa, and getting that split in the ANC. And then you've also got the white brothers and sisters, that slice of white progressives, and then the, the white elites, who still have a disproportionate amount of power when it comes to the economy. So that's the kind of question you raise, but I'll never even begin to answer that personal question for you. I just know you're going to do some wonderful things, but I, I wouldn't answer that one. Don't you ever go right here? You got Brother Counter in the back there. You got my dear Brother Counter in the back there. Lord, it's so good to see you, my brother. Lord, yes, go right here. Professor, um, thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. Thank you for your, um, the way that you speak to the spirit and um, the emotion throughout your work in the last, over, over, the, uh, over the past decades um, for the way that you speak. Um, I, I have sort of a twofold, twofold question. Um, you spoke in an essay I read, I forgot what, uh, what the name of it was, um, about having sort of armor, spiritual armor against um, sort of, um, sort of a mercantilist ideology against apathy. Um, and I was wondering sort of, firstly, how do we gird ourselves and, and keep um, true to ourselves? How do we keep authentic? How do we keep moral? Um, how do we keep emotional um, in a world that's hostile to that? Um, and secondly is how do we um, move in the world to make the world uh, less, less of a hostile um, place to, to emotionality, authenticity, and integrity? Mm, oh, that's, yeah, those are two tough ones, though, man. I, you, you may have been alluding to my writings on nihilism, which is a kind of philosophic analog to catastrophe. Plato begins responding to Thrasymachus, might makes right. That's catastrophic. If might really makes right, we all need to go to the crack house. <laughs> it's over. Where's the moral witness? Where's the concern about others? It's just my, makes right. No, Plato says, I got a response to it. Socrates laid it out for Glucon and others. Whitehead says, Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. And it's as if Nietzsche is sitting there waiting in the appendix. Because Nietzsche is obsessed with passive and active nihilism. Well, those are my kind of philosophers in the West. You see. Even though I both have deep disagreements with both of them philosophically, spiritually, and politically. They're profound because they're dealing with catastrophe. How do you sustain yourself intellectually, morally, culturally, spiritually in the face of Thrasymachus-like ways of being in the world? In ways in the face of will to power, which the strong dominate and crush the weak in, 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 in the Nietzschean belt and challenge. And I've, I've tried to suggest that it's primarily through some kinds of decisions we make that we try to shape and mold ourselves in lights of traditions that provide someone at our back with no guarantee whatsoever of victory, capital V or small v. And we learn you know, the great lesson of Samuel Beckett, try again, fail again, fail better. Try again, fail again, fail better. That's the best that we fallible creatures do in time and space. We try to tell the truth, write our text, teach, so forth and so on. 
and, uh, and then pass it on to the next generation owing in part to what's been passed on to us. That's part of the reciprocity, the Sankofa-like sensibility. Looking backward, the highest standards of arate, of excellence, that serve as standards for our present and then pass it on to the next generation. That's why as you get older, it's such a beautiful thing to see, to see young folk uh, taking up that kind of challenge and taking it in new ways that you hadn't even conceived of. But it's, it's very fragile. Very fragile and very slippery. You know, the great Hillary Putnam used to say, we, we, on the tightrope, it's very difficult to walk, but we do walk. We do move. Curtis Mayfield just said, keep on pushing. That's another version. <laughs> <laughs> just so, keep, keep walking and pushing. We're just about out of time, so I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last question Ooh, over right? here. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe we should let our dear brother Ken. He's, he's, he's such an icon. Take two questions. Yes, we'll take yeah. two. And then, well, well I hate to okay, exclude we'll you, though. You all right on that? All right. And get your consent we'll get, on that? We'll get three, appreciate, que three appreciate. last appreciate. questions. All right, there we go, right quick. Uh, Salam alaikum, brother Cornell. Oh, how you doing, my dear uh, brother? Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to thank you before I ask my question for writing The Radical King, or at least putting it together. It was a really profound work, and it's just something that left a really big impact on me. Um, I come from the West Coast, from the Palmer Muslim American community, but I think this entire election cycle has been incredibly uh, vitriolic for Muslim Americans in general, and I think it's incredibly obvious, but um, I think a recent article just said that America is worse off in terms of its Islamophobia, Islamophobia now than it was after 9-11. Um, and I think just growing up in this environment, it can have a very weighty effect on my soul. Um, so I guess, uh, in general, what my two questions are, uh, number one, how do you continue to have, how do you con continue to cultivate hope uh, amid hopeless conditions? And number two, what advice do you have for um, the Muslim American community when it comes to how to deal with this predicament mm. or cat catastrophe? Yeah, Thank you. no, I appreciate it. Appreciate the question. Appreciate the question. Well, one, for me, tremendous sign of hope is the, uh, the younger generation is certainly less xenophobic now than it was in the 1980s when I was teaching. Certainly the case in the 1960s. Uh, and the kind of support that uh, Brother Trump gets among those under 35 is very small, very small. Now, I don't say that for young people to just pat themselves on the back become apathetic, but breakthroughs have been made and the younger generation has received them critically in such a way that they're less racist. You wouldn't have a black president if, it had, if America wasn't less racist. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, therefore you just give somebody a prize because you're less racist than their grandparents. <laughs> and Brother Malcolm said, you don't stab folk in the back nine inches, pull it out six inches and celebrate your progress. <laughs> but you do acknowledge the progress, very real. Uh, uh, secondly, though, I would say when it comes to hope, and we're wrestling with this, Brother Tommy and Brother Brandon were wrestling with this book on, uh, on hope and despair in Martin King, is that right, the next, next year or so? And this issue of uh, the difference between having hope and being a hope. You see, you can reach a point, you know that line in Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk, folk hopeless, unhopeful, but still trying in some sense to enact and embody hope. And I'm a blues man to the core. Been blues man all my life, gonna die a blues man. Mediated with the cross, the way of the cross. You know? And when D.B. King says, nobody loves me but my mom and she might be driving too. <laughs> That's catastrophic. But he got so much style with Lucille when he does it. And all of that rich tradition of Robert Johnson and Bessie Smith, Lightning Hopkins coming through his guitar. And he got so much style in doing it. He is hope. And he offers his big heart to others so that they can be hope, not just have an abstract virtue. Well, I, I need some hope today. No, are you a hope? Mm -hmm. Is your way of life one in which it does leave some kind of impact in vacation Bible school in Shiloh Baptist Church, we used to say if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. 
That's not heaven somewhere up there. It's what kind of impact will your life have on folk in such a way that you empower them precisely because even if there is no overarching hope, there's going to be left, less hope if we don't empower each other. And there's too much suffering out there to be despairing. Too much suffering to be despairing. Despair is always a vice when it comes to being a hope. Like you're raising a disabled child, so precious. Somebody said, oh, Lord, this, your autistic, uh, disabled child, you're going to have a rough time all your life. You watch this. Watch me love this child to death. Watch this child have smiles on them, her face and so forth. That's being a hope at that concrete level. That's what being a blues person is. And again, it's not a matter of skin pigmentation. Because we've got a lot of sentimental Negroes out here. They're not blues-like at all. Don't think just because they're black, they innately sing the blues. No. Blues is a choice. It's a choice to fight, choice to love, choice to fight for justice, choice to pay that cost and so forth. Now, I'm going to have real short responses to these last two. Yeah, um, hi, Dr. West. Thanks for taking my question. Um, my name is Miranda Suarez. I'm a student journalist at Boston University. Um, I was just wondering if I could ask you a question about the election in terms of your support of Jill Stein. Yeah. What do you think it would take? What kind of social or political shifts would it take for a third party or progressive candidate to actually win the presidency? This election? This and any election. This election would be a miracle. Let's talk, about the, let's talk about the next election. Yeah, in the next election, we, we don't know. Okay. We know the establishment Republican Party is undergoing decimation. The establishment, party, the establishment of the Democratic Party was running frightened for a while owing to the power of Bernie Sanders and those supporting him, you see. We came close, we didn't pull it off. But the establishment of both parties undergo transformation, then you have possibilities, very much like 1860s, for new parties to emerge. But you, the important thing is, is that you don't want to lose your commitment to thinking critically and outside of the box simply because you got this one election. The election is over, you got to be vigilant the day after the election, a year after the election, next two years, next four years, push it, push it. Many of us un remember Ronald Reagan, and I grew up in California. How could Reagan win? Greed is not enough. Right wing backlash against social movements, against women and gay brothers and lesbian sisters and so forth, you see. And uh, Trump's worse than Reagan, but still, you know, it, it's a possibility. Hillary wins. Well, we need some serious critique. Wall Street, drones, surveillance, the same critiques we need under Obama. Now, what's going to be interesting is to watch the black voices surface with power. All of a sudden, they're going to be real critical of the white sister. But the black brother was doing exactly the same thing. A lot of them wouldn't say a mumbling word, you see. Now, that's going to be funky. <laughs> and the reason why it's going to be funky is that you can easily lose your moral authority if you only criticize in some folks selectively and there's no consistency in what you say. Now, I'm going to be with the black brothers and sisters anyway, but I will remind them of their hypocrisy and their inconsistency. Why? Because there were folks suffering under those eight years of a black president. Mass incarceration, poverty, privatized education. We go on and on and on. You see, civil rights organizations, you know. Wouldn't say a mumbling word. There's no such thing as a black agenda. That's what they said in 2009 and 2011 when they left the White House. No black agenda. What you talking about? No, we're all Americans. Please, get off the crack pipe. Since when have black people somehow been exactly the same as other Americans? But the leadership said that because they were told to say that from the Oval Office with Martin King's face in his sculpture, they're looking and crying as he watched Steve's folk engage in this kind of dialogue. Malcolm X turning over in his grave. Gil Scott Heron about to hurt somebody. Because he's a truth teller, you see what I mean? I don't get too fired up about this though, but this is very important. Very important in terms of commitment, the struggles for freedom and liberty. One last question, why did brother? So good to see you though, man. Good to see you, sir. Welcome home. Yeah, it's nice. always a blessing. To be well, here. I'm one of the few people in the room who uh, knew you as an undergraduate. You were as inspiring then as you are now, and um, the other way around. But I want to ask you about uh, contrasting 
as you see it, the Harvard of today with the Harvard of the time you were here as an undergraduate, where you had a profound impact on other students and indeed faculty at that time. And, and hopefully you'll come back and join us. Well, I tell you, man, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful question, though. Um, it's a wonderful question. I well, appreciate that, though, definitely. But um, I mean, what I didn't get a chance to go into, of course, is the Preston Williams and Martin Kielsons and other black professors who meant the world to We have portraits alongside. of them now on the walls. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and uh, the impact of, um, of Brother Skip and the others in the 1990s, the William Julius Wilsons and Evelyn Higginbotham's and others coming in and really reshaping so much of the, uh, the public discourse here uh, at Harvard and the curriculum here at Harvard. Our yeah, sister Professor Allen, one voice among the others. So many new, crucial, rich, subtle voices. Very, very different than what I was used to. When I arrived, of course, we had one tenured professor who was black. And that was at Kilson in 1968. And then here comes Orlando Patterson, towering figure. One of the finest of all black academicians in the last 50 years, straight out of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. A little Bob Marley sensibility, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, and it began to grow, as you know. Clyde Ferguson at the law school, Derrick Bell at the law school, to be able to, to be there with you. And of course, David Evans playing such a fundamental role in terms of admissions. Now, I haven't been at Harvard for a while. Uh, uh, how long, brother, brother Brandon? Was it uh, about four, four years ago you invited me? About three or four, something like that, though. I haven't been at Harvard for a while, so I have to get a sense. But when I do come in, it's a very different place. It's a very different place. There's no doubt about it. But the challenge is, is to keep the, um, the hope, the struggle, the progress moving. You don't want to become satisfied with what you, what you do have. Mm -hmm. And then it connected to all the other magnificent uh, breakthroughs. I mean, one of the big breakthroughs was, of course, 1965, where the Black Freedom Movement said, look, we've had a white supremacist immigration policy. Let's open it up. We got all this wonderful wave of Asians and Africans and others, which is now reshaped the nation and reshape American higher education. Because when I was here, it was rare to see Asian faces. Now, you remember that? It was very rare. And there was only one Puerto Rican. He's my roommate, Brother Garcia, Roberto <laughs> Garcia. We had one Puerto Rican in the whole school. And he was, I mean, he was black, but that was his choice. And we loved it. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but with the Asians now, in a, such a beautiful way, moving in, it, it does change things in, I think, a very positive way. Let's say thank you. Thank you very much.